Good evening, and welcome to the Henry Schein Dental Academy webinar series. My name is Adam, and I'll be your moderator. Tonight, we're joined by Dr. Narain Rajan as he discusses how patient engagement apps can boost case acceptance and practice revenue. At any point during the webinar, if you have a question, please type it into the Q&A section of your control panel, and we'll reply to you via email within two business days. Henry Schein is not offering CE credit for viewing or attending this presentation live or on demand, and this webinar is sponsored by 3Shape. Dr. Rajan, welcome. Well, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening. I'm Dr. Narain Rajan, and I'm happy to be with you for the next hour. I'd like to thank Henry Schein and 3Shape for the ongoing opportunities to share my experiences with digital dentistry. In 2020, the CEO of Henry Schein, Stanley Bergman, stated that the use of intraoral scanners had reached an early majority. And yet, despite presenting about adopting and leveraging intraoral scanning for the past five years, I've noticed too many dentists not realizing the true potential of the technology. I've witnessed too many dentists unable to connect the dots on how best to use these incredible tools we could have only imagined a few years ago. So in 2020, one of my goals is to empower every trios dentist to maximize their three-shaped technology to elevate the level of care they're providing for their patients. And using the integrated patient engagement apps can significantly boost case acceptance and ultimately increase practice revenue while more importantly, achieving the best possible clinical outcomes for our patients. And there's never been a better time to begin than now. By the end of this program, my hope is you will all know exactly how to begin realizing the promise of, dig of digital dentistry. When I first began with digital dentistry back in 2007, it was with same day chair side CAD cam systems. And it meant having to completely change my daily routines or the system wouldn't be of much use. What makes getting started with digital dentistry with 3Shape is the ability to learn and implement at your own pace. We can learn to crawl, then walk, then run, and then fly. And it's reasonable to expect that this will take some time and it may be different for each specific clinician. And we recommend to move at your own pace to attain whatever level of proficiency you desire. When first getting started with your intraoral scanner, use it for basic operations, obtaining diagnostic scans for your patients, learning to navigate the software and integrating it into your daily routines. Shortly thereafter, we recommend to start using it for small restorative cases, whether on natural teeth or implants, stick to one or two units. And as you start to get some familiarity with those workflows and work with your laboratory and start to get over the initial learning curve, that's when things can really get interesting and you can start to implement non-restorative workflows, which we're gonna be talking about today with the patient engagement apps. And that's when we start using it for things like smile design and implant planning, maybe using it for removable, and sometime after that, when really get to get to a mastery level of, of knowledge is when you can maybe incorporate your own design, in-house printing, in-house milling, using it for complex cases and full arts cases. And today we're gonna to spend some time talking about how to really leverage the patient engagement apps, including patient monitoring, patient-specific motion, as well as smile design. So let's talk about scanning, except let's challenge the conventional thinking of what we consider an intraoral scanner, the main purpose in our practices, because many people consider an intraoral scanner still as simply a replacement for impression material for restorative procedures. And while we use our intraoral scanner every day for restorative procedures, it's actually the very last thing that we use the scanner for. And there's many other things that come before that where we really leverage the, um, the beauty of this technology. 
My teaching partner and colleague, Dr. Alan Durham, is a dual trained engineer as well as a dentist. And when he lectures, he gives, he gives a great perspective about something called process mapping. This is something that engineers do all the time. And we consider process mapping and everything that we do in practice, it becomes very clear on how to use this technology. Very basically, a process map is basically a process where we identify an input, a process, and that leads to an output. And as dentists, if you think about it, we really do the same tasks over and over again. For example, let's create a process map for how a new patient comes into our practice. So let's consider the input to be the new patient and the comprehensive visit that we spend uh, and deliver to this patient the first time they see us. And let's consider the output to be delivering definitive treatment when necessary, and then putting that patient into our recall system. Well, everything that happens in between is the process. And if we think about doing these things in a very organized fashion, we find that we can really start to control the outputs and get more predictable results. And with the conventional thinking of where we would use an intraoral scanner or digital technology in this process map, thinking about how People conventionally think about intraoral scanners only being for impression material replacement. Well, we would only use it in this one box of our process map, and that is delivering the definitive treatment. But in, in reality, you'll see that we actually use our intraoral scanner or the, the integrated software applications in every part of our process map. And you'll see how this really elevates what we can do for our patients. Let's hear from one of our patients. I think I've been subjected or part of all the different kind of dental technologies uh, that haven't always been the most pleasant. And I mean, the idea of the speed and the ease with all of this technology throughout this entire process has been kind of mind blowing. So she says that the entire process was kind of mind blowing. And this is a great thing to hear from one of our patients. And we're trying to differentiate ourselves and improve our level of care, I would love for all of my patients to say, well, why did you say that after going through the process of getting treatment in our office? And it really comes down to our ability to create connection for our patients. And how do we create this experience for them? It brings us to the, the concept of something that I like to call the four T's. And it's the four T's of creating connection and experience for our patients. Well, the first T is our trios. And what do we really use our trios for? First and foremost in our office. And it's to really provide transparency for our patients. Patients today need to see what we're seeing. They don't tend to just believe us and as they may have in previous generations. People really need to see what, what we're talking about and what we're thinking about doing. And the sooner that we provide transparency for our patients, we move to the third T, and that is trust. The sooner we can provide transparency, the sooner that we can establish trust with our patients. And trust is really what this is all about, in my opinion, because the sooner that our patients trust us, the sooner that we'll most likely get treatment acceptance. And this is what a lot of us are really want to get to with our new patients. We've also found that making a trio scan a prominent part of our first visit really helps us do all the things that we need to do during a comprehensive examination, from helping identify the patient's chief concerns to um, capturing the uh, practical data that we need, such as the charting of the teeth while I'm speaking to a patient and maybe we're streaming this uh, scan up on the large monitor that's in the room. My assistant, Robin, who's just off to the right of this photograph, she can be actually uh, starting to chart the restorations, charting the missing teeth. And so we do all the practical um, duties that we need to uh, with a comprehensive new patient exam by incorporating this digital technology. Thomas Paine is, was an American revolutionary. He said, the mind once enlightened cannot become dark. We've noticed that once the patient 
is enlightened, they don't usually ignore their findings. And so in order to do this, we really recommend to use your trios and to build your patient libraries as soon as possible. And this is really what's necessary to move beyond using the scanner simply as impression material replacement and to really start to build upon uh, your non-restorative workflows. And the trio scanning process has become so fast these days that we can easily find time these days to actually incorporate getting these full scans, um, either doing recall visits or uh, routine visits that we're seeing our patients for. And so the, the question starts to come up sometimes in um, live lectures is, you know, who's responsible for this first scan? How are we going to find time to do another thing in our busy days with our patients? Well, um, the, we have three options, really. The dentist can do the first scan, the dental assistant can do the first scan, or the dental hygienist. And really, you know, in our office, it is all of the above. Um, and it really is up to you to be able to figure out what is the best way to, to obtain this input of having an intraoral scan. And the TRIOS comes with restorative analysis tools. And these tools were designed by the engineers to help us uh, use it as a restorative tool, as a replacement for impression material. So uh, we have the ability to measure the shade uh, of a particular tooth to communicate with the technician. We have uh, the opportunity to write annotations right on the scan to communicate with the technicians. We uh, have the ability to measure our occlusal clearance uh, to be sure that we've created the right amount of reduction for restorative procedures. And we can even tell if we've incorporated an undercut or if we're trying to do a fixed bridge and these tools are really helpful, but I'm going to show you how we actually use these tools routinely to create connection and experience for our patients. For example, let's look at the clearance tool. The longer I'm in practice, I'm in practice 18 years this year, the longer that we're in practice and the more patients that we see, uh, and you may agree, is that uh, more patients than not are presenting to our offices with some level of occlusal findings. And this has always been something that's been difficult. Uh, for me at least, to create a connection experience and try to connect with the patient that something with their bite has something to do with their chief concerns. And so the way that we use these tools to really create transparency is we actually combine the analog and the digital techniques. So before, um, if I see a new patient and I'm suspecting that there's some occlusal component to their etiology or their chief concern, I'll actually mark the teeth first. And uh, I trained at the Panky Institute and this is the way that we were taught to do it. We dry the teeth with um, Kleenexes and a Miller forcep. After the teeth are very dry, then we have the patient go to the red and rub on the red and to create the excursive patterns. And then we put the blue in and have them tap on it. That gives us our centric marks overwritten over the excursive patterns. And what we can do then is actually show the patients what we're actually seeing. And when we started to look at the, at the digital bite analysis that is incorporated into every intraoral scanner, uh, including the TRIOS, we started to notice that we can almost account for every single occlusal mark that we made with the analog bite paper with the digital bite analysis. And so we can start to correlate things and start to look at the data on the screen and see if we can help patients. And um, a patient that, that came in that was actually um, complaining of pain in an area where they had a restoration and they had gone back to their dentist and um, they still couldn't chew on this tooth, tooth number 15 had an onlay. We actually just applied this technique and we actually showed the patient that there was a non-working contact uh, on this onlay. And this patient that came in to see me, this particular patient, couldn't chew on this tooth. And uh, shortly after I relieved this non-working um, tooth contact, a few, few days later, she could chew on the tooth. Now, um, I didn't really come up with a novel way of finding this balancing contact. Um, we basically just um, 
provided transparency to the patient by using the digital technology. And she could actually see what we were talking about. We weren't just kind of grinding on the tooth uh, indiscriminately. We we're following a process and um, it eventually led to her getting better. And uh, being able to explain this to a patient without being able to visually see it is, is somewhat difficult in my opinion. Uh, actually showing them and explaining what we'll, we will be adjusting and why that creates connection and experience. This patient had never seen a dental issue worked up in this manner, and it creates a powerful experience that builds trust with us. Um, and especially if there's new dentists out in the, um, in the audience tonight, this is a great way to uh, do something different than the patient's previous clinician uh, when you're trying to build trust and you're trying to build a practice. And so this is really, you know, the idea of what we use this, the, the technology for. It's to provide transparency, to build trust. And within our dental desktop software, it's not only the place that uh, we store our trio scans, but it's actually the, the platform that we use to launch into the integrated software patient engagement apps. And when we talk about these patient engagement apps, like I mentioned before, we're talking about something called patient monitoring, which allows us to compare one trio scan taken at in time and compare it to future scans. Uh, so we can see what's different about them. Patient specific motion, which is um, a process by which we can actually record the actual mandibular movements of our patient. And uh, Trio Smile, that's Smile Design, which is the uh, which is the digital smile design software built into our systems. So patient specific motion, we actually use in a few ways. We use it for connection and experience. When we in, encounter patients that have uh, wear issues and especially that are related to the pathway of their occlusion. Maybe they have abfractive lesions. Maybe they have severe wear like this patient did. Um, it, being able to record that video input as part of our scanning protocol and then have that playing on the screen, it, it really helps to communicate with this to the patient that um, there may be a, a concern with their bite or concern with their um, occlusal pattern that's contributing to their dental disease. Once we have this video file of how the jaws are moving, we also have the ability to then communicate that with our three-shape powered dental laboratory. And so on the right side, you're actually watching two units of crown and bridge being designed in the laboratory and the, the very same um, mandibular movement pattern is being applied and they can actually see whether there we have any excursive interferences and it leads to cleaner designs with less post-operative adjustments. When it comes to TRIOS patient monitoring, um, the original idea with uh, the software was to be able to show a patient two different sets of data and to establish what's different about them. And so you know, having a patient get connection and experience with the fact that they're getting tooth wear um, can be problematic because many patients are asymptomatic when, even when they have moderate wear. Uh, and how do we prove to a patient or um, uh, help them to, to seek treatment sooner in the process rather than waiting for things to get um, to a late stage of wear? And that is how we use TRIAS patient monitoring. So it's it's, it's, it's very advantageous to be able to speak with a patient and say, listen, anything that's green uh, is the same as it was in the past. And anything that's yellow and red uh, is significantly different. And here's why we think it is, and here's what we can do about it. We use trace patient monitoring for much more than just communicating tooth wear to our patients. For instance, uh, it's a great tool to be able to communicate with our specialists. This patient actually prior to having uh, a 10 unit um, smile reconstruction or smile makeover um, needed to have some gingival grafting uh, on the first bicuspids and the canines. And when she came back from this grafting, she actually wasn't sure how su successful the grafting had been. Um, but it's very easy to actually show her 
with TRIO's patient monitoring. We have a pre-op scan prior to grafting. You have a scan after the grafting and really show um, the areas of the mouth that have significantly changed. And obviously the area that significantly changed for her um, was the area of the connective tissue grafting done by my periodontist. It's also great to be able to show the periodontist um, what the results were. And that really helps um, a dentist to actually stand out in his or her community with, um, with their specialists. And it's actually been a source of growth in my personal practice because um, by and large, the other dentists in my area are not communicating with the specialists in my area um, with this level of data and presentation. And so when you're able to actually align two data sets taken at different times very accurately, um, it allows you to actually take cross sections. And uh, it really leads to one of the really big concepts of 3D dentistry. And one of the biggest concepts of digital dentistry is being able to take a 3D data set and cut a line through it and take two dimensional cross sectional measurements. The digital dental lab technicians have been doing this for years. It's one of the most commonly used tools when they're designing restorations, being able to measure um, specific thicknesses of restorations at, at different points. And when we come back to the example of the patient with the gingival grafting, um, you know how, um, how amazing is it to be able to take these two scans and to be able to measure exactly how much gingival coverage our periodontist got for us. And when um, the patient sees us being able to actually look at data like this, and when I can communicate with my specialists like this, it, it really changes the level of care uh, that we're able to provide for our patients simply because of the fact that we have data to, um, to, to compare and to measure and to analyze and to manage. Um, and these tools are built directly into our into every full TRIO system, we just have to have the data to be able to look for it. So build these libraries as soon as you can. How many times does a patient come in and maybe complain uh, or report to us that their bite is changing? Prior to really using all these digital techniques on a routine basis, if a patient mentioned something like this to me in hygiene, it'd be difficult to come up with a productive answer, um, you know, because we don't have something to look back at. And so this patient I had restored maybe three or four years prior to her coming in and saying that my bite has changed. Uh, we had restored the upper six um, anterior teeth. And she came in one time in hygiene and she says, it, it feels like I'm hitting these two front teeth heavier than I used to. Uh, and it's very easy today to be able to take the same kind of cross-sectional measurements from two different scans. Uh, and in fact, when we take cross-sectional uh, measurements between of her central incisors, we can actually see that those central incisors have moved about a quarter millimeter over the past couple of years. And so when she complains that my bite has changed, we can say, well, yes, it has. And then we can decide whether we need to provide some kind of treatment, whether we're gonna refer the patient to the orthodontist to have some aligner therapy, um, or if we do some occlusal equilibration, um, or maybe the third option is to not treat it and, and to watch it and monitor it. And it doesn't matter which one of those three options that, that we do because it's actually based out of having data and having information sharing it with the patient, providing transparency, and it, it shows the patient that we go through intentional uh, thinking before we just come up with treatments. And this is something that we weren't always able to do prior to digitizing the process. Maybe another patient comes in and she says the same thing. She says that my bite has changed. And she pointed to this lower lateral incisor. And she said, you know what? This tooth has never stuck out more than it has since the last time that I saw you. I think my whole bite is changing. And just like the last patient, it's very easy to go in there and take a new scan and say, okay, let's get a new scan and let's measure the situation. And what we found in this particular case is that tooth that had never stuck out more than it had never, uh, than it ever had 
was in fact within 0 0.05 millimeters of where it was two years prior to when I took the second scan. So when I compared the, the original scan, the trio scan when she was a new patient to this new scan, those teeth are, are basically in an identical position. And so when this patient is worried that her bite has changed, we can pretty confidently tell her, well, no, your bite is stable. And now we um, can really satisfy this patient's concerns. And once you saw it on the screen, she really accepted it versus if we didn't have this data to show her, it would have been pretty difficult to convince her otherwise. And as we all know, nobody ever won an argument with a patient. So build your patient libraries as soon as possible. But you may say that's going to take years. You know, I haven't been scanning every patient for uh, many years to this point. Um, how am I going, going to leverage this technology, you know, without waiting two to four years? Um, I had another longtime patient that came in and says, I think my teeth may have shifted. Uh, and what we actually did with this patient is back in 2011, we made this patient an occlusal guard and we give everybody their models. And in this case, um, I said, you know, do you think you can bring those models in? Do you still have them? And she said, yes. Um, so it's very easy to take a set of stone casts. We can scan them with our trios. And now we have that data point from 2011. And then we can actually scan her again and we can do exactly what we did with the other cases. So you can use, you know, old stone models that a lot of patients walk around, they have a box of their models and, and you can go through. And if you have the times of when those models are taken, it's very easy to actually create a digital library uh, to start benefiting from these, um, these ad ad advances as soon as possible. Those of you that are involved with uh, um, implant bridges, hybrids, all on X type treatments, um, we use patient monitoring to actually evaluate how well um, our conversion prostheses were made based on the preoperative conditions. And so this particular patient uh, was interested in keeping um, her preoperative um, dimensions of her smile. She wanted to actually copy the contours of her upper six um, uh, crowns that she had, and she had significant decay that was going on. The decision was made to um, employ dual arch um, immediate implant bridge therapy. And the provisionals, which we converted on one day, um, uh, we took photographs about a week after the surgery was made and we take a trio scan as well. And now, you know, when we can actually use the cross-sectional analysis, we can actually compare, you know, how well did, did we uh, transfer these relationships preoperatively into the surgical prostheses. And you can see here, we took a cross-section through the central incisors and the tooth positions are essentially the same. Um, as her preoperative uh, tooth positions. And, and, and just as importantly, we can take a section through the posterior sections and we can appreciate that we actually didn't change the vertical dimension at all. And so this becomes a very predictable way to actually um, compare uh, treatments that were done in more complex cases as well. And it wouldn't be possible if we didn't have this Trios patient monitoring application at our disposal. And so this, this really helps us to get more, uh, more predictable results with treatments that can potentially uh, significantly change a patient. And we're also responsible for monitoring our patients for more serious conditions and uh, oral cancer and um, soft tissue lesions and this patient's um, name was Carol, and she came in a couple of years ago, and she said that um, she noticed a lesion on her palate, and she had just been in to see me three months prior to this limited visit um, to replace the two crowns on her upper central incisors, uh, and she came in and said, you know, I have this lesion on my palate, and I'm wondering, do you think it was there when I just came to see you a few months ago to do those crowns? Um, and that could potentially be um, 
uh, an uncomfortable potential confrontation with a patient uh, where obviously, um, you know, to all of you listening out there, if that lesion was there the day that you were preparing number eight and nine, it's probably safe to say that most all of us would have noticed and would probably say something to the patient, but the patient doesn't know that. So when my students at the dental school or, or uh, other dentists ask, you know, when I take a scan for two crowns, do I need to scan the whole mouth? Um, we say yes, you know, and, you know, this is part of the patient library as well. So how long does it really take to just complete the scan? And so every scan we take, whether it's a single tooth or a full arch reconstruction is a full scan and we get all the soft tissues. And so now we can go back to that visit three months prior to February, 2019. And we can actually, we, we have that, that data point that that lesion on her, her palate was in fact not present when she came to see us for those two crowns. And so this immediately, you know, really helped this patient feel, um, feel comforted that we didn't miss something. It, um, it did a lot to provide the transparency and the trust that we're after. And she was really happy to be able to know that this was something new and she could seek uh, the proper specialist care for it. So a lot of times when we think about incorporating technology into dentistry, um, the questions are usually that the dentists ask are, are pretty much what's in it for me? What's in it for us? How is this going to improve um, my, my practice? How is this going to improve productivity? How is it gonna improve revenue? Um, and really for me, you know, after being in this for the past um, five, six years with these particular workflows, after experiencing all the benefits that we can get for the patient, I think a better question is not what's in it for us, but what's in it for the patient if we really start to incorporate these things. And so, you know, uh, using the monitoring app helps you manage tooth wear, tooth positions, recession, soft tissue changes. You know, they have caries detection that's coming as well. And so in many ways, intraoral scanning originally was thought of, of, of predominantly something that was a treatment tool. Whereas today, we really use the intraoral scanner for diagnosis as well as long-term management. And so now let's actually look at some of the other non-restorative workflows and you know how we really leverage Trio's um, smile design uh, into our daily workflows to get more predictable results, better case acceptance, and more productivity for our practice. So when we think about the term smile design, smile design um, uh, is basically a process by which we propose where the uh, new restorations are going to um, be in three dimensions, correct? Um, and that's how a lot of courses and, and different softwares basically present the process of smile design. It's basically overlaying a proposed outcome over an existing condition. But in our practice, actually, smile design has become a lot more than that. We're using these tools to create, just like we said before, transparency and trust. And so by involving the patient with um, the software, we, we, we really create a substantive interaction with them revolving around them and their treatment. And it helps us to build better relationships with our patients, provide a better experience, as well as helping us provide better diagnosis, better informed consent, and better treatment planning. Let's go back to our process map. When we talk about the process map of definitive treatment, it really is the right side of the highlighted area there. Every case goes through the same process to get to the outcomes. So when treatment is recommended or desired, we always move to a phase of two-dimensional and three-dimensional virtual planning. After we've done that virtual planning, we always try to do some kind of a live preview or a mock-up to test whether our two-dimensional and three-dimensional virtual planning um, was effective. After we've done that live preview is when we move to the treatment phase where we're going to prepare, provisionalize if there's surgery, and that's what ultimately leads to the definitive treatment or the output. 
And so when we look at the prosthetic process map, it's the same thing every time. We move through smile design, digital wax up, mock up, provisional, final. Let me introduce you to Kathy. Kathy um, was a, a longtime patient, but she had these, uh, these laminate veneers done prior to becoming a patient in our office. And over the years, um, they developed some recurrent decay around the margins and the previous clinician had patched them with uh, flowable composite. Uh, she never really liked the shade of the restorations, and she always felt they looked a little bit um, uh, not straight. She felt that they were a little crooked. And so she was interested in actually replacing these restorations a couple of years ago. And for her case, we actually employed Trio Smile Design. And these are the two most important photographs that you will need to take and be comfortable taking in order to get a successful smile design. And so you need to be able to take clear portraits. The patient needs to be um, able to sit up upright. Um, and these two photos need to be taken, you know, if one after another, and the patient can't turn their head very much because these two photos are gonna be aligned on top of one another. And we're gonna be able to toggle back and forth and design this patient's new smile. And so when we wanna do this, we all we need to do is go into dental uh, desktop and choose smile design and then we hit the plus hour on the right side as noted here and we bring these two photographs in now um, our scans and our photography are done in the clinical area and we're set up with three shape client server setup so the computer that i'm getting the scans with is not the computer that I'm going to be actually doing the digital smile design on. So my trios that is on our custom cart is considered a client and we can move that around the office. And as soon as we take our scans and post-process them, they're automatically saved onto our three shape server. This isn't the main server of the whole office. This is the server that is managing our three shape data. And in our office, it, happens to be on the gaming desktop that's in my consult room. And so once this is done, I can actually bring the patient, you know, out of the clinical area, we can sit around um, my consultation table. And we can actually start to do this digital smile design, you know, live with the patient. During COVID, this actually became uh, a really uh, useful tool as well, because we we're able to do some teledentistry visits this way to be able to actually manage and triage cases. But when we did Kathy's smile design, we have the ability to preview what you know certain generic shapes are going to look like. Does she have a square? Does she look good with square teeth, oval teeth, triangular teeth? We have the ability to actually look at the length to width ratio. We try to keep um, within these golden proportions. So usually we use those as a guide. So usually I like to be somewhere between 77 and 80% width to length ratio on the central incisors. But it goes beyond that. We have the ability to actually preview um, uh, specific libraries that were created by other technicians, um, very popular ones like Matt Roberts from CMR in Idaho. We can also um, preview donor smiles, which are smile libraries that have been digitized from other patients with nice smiles. And this is really one of the emerging trends now that was made, po um, made popular by a Swedish lab technician named Shemek Swerniak. And he, him and his wife, Kate, um, had uh, published a book called Fabulous Smiles a couple of years ago. And what they did is they digitized the smiles of 18 people. These are just patients with naturally beautiful smiles. They're not necessarily perfect smiles, but they um, he digitized smiles of young patients, adult patients, and older patients. And so this is actually the workflow of how we do many of our smile designs now is that we actually give the patient this coffee table book, we show them shapes of different smiles and just actually just the perioral smile page. And we ask them what they like. And then from there, we can actually start to center in which libraries to use to design their new smile. So it actually makes a way that we can customize 
these smile designs for patients instead of every case looking exactly the same. Uh, when you send out for a wax up, you, the lab technician may be able to do one or two styles of wax ups. Um, and it, you do run the risk of the cases always looking about the same. And this gives you an opportunity to make it really customized for every particular patient. So we start again with the two most important pictures. And once we, we do that is that we can actually apply all these different libraries to our, to our patients. Something that I'd learned out of this process a couple of years ago is that is that smiles are a lot more unisex than I had originally learned in dental school. And in school, we learned that, you know, big guys with square jaws had square teeth and little women with round faces had oval teeth. And, you know, and that seemed to make sense. But, but actually, uh, in practice, we found that that's not necessarily the case because half of these libraries on my photographs are from males and half of them are females. And you may find that um, it's, it's not um, as gender uh, specific as, as you may have thought in the past. And so in this particular case, uh, we, um, we showed the patient Matt Roberts library and she actually said, hey, that's actually what my teeth used to look like before I had these veneers. I like that. And so that was actually a really good way to create connection and experience, get this patient on our side before we do a significant treatment. So this is the winner. This is the output of any digital smile design software, including the Trio Smile Design. It's just this photograph with this wireframe architectural drawing of a new smile. But, but that doesn't really create a lot of connection and experience for the patient. And so we're able to now actually add color and texture to this wireframe architectural drawing. And the patient can actually, she's sitting in my consult room, she can actually see what this is going to look like and start to imagine herself with this treatment before we've done anything irreversible. It's at this point that I give the mouse to the patient and I ask them to just slide back and forth. And then I do my best to not say anything and just let the room be quiet, let the patient scroll back and forth, because this is when they really start to think about, you know, is this what they want to do? And they start to imagine themselves with a new smile. And at, and at the end of that, before I take my mouse back, I'll stop it right in the middle and I'll snap a screenshot, the 50-50 screenshot. And so there's no question here as to where we're starting, where we're thinking about going. And if you're, if you're interested in finding how to use these patient engagement app, um, apps to actually increase your case acceptance, it's using it in this way, in my opinion. This is what's actually, I think, been responsible for me doing much more uh, reconstructive types of cases and moving out of single tooth dentistry more often in every month is, is that we started to apply these process maps and these protocols and these procedures and we present it in this particular way and people tend to want to move forward with treatment more than they did before in my personal experience. And so she actually decided to do treatment with us and we were going to uh, actually do about, I think eight or 10 units in this case, I think it was eight. And this is actually what you're seeing on the right side of the screen is what happens in the laboratory. And so the laboratory is also going to get these portraits that we took. Now they've aligned the trio scan that we took onto this portrait photograph. And now they can visualize the preoperative contours. They can do their design and they can make sure that they're adapting uh, the three-dimensional wax up uh, design to the two-dimensional output of our smile design, which you see on the left, that's all, that's all it is, the wireframe architectural drawing. And they can start to come up with what the new shapes of the teeth are going to be. And this is, this is essentially where the process goes from 2D to 3D or two shape to three shape, if you will. And so we wanna be able to move into that mock-up phase for this patient. And so uh, nowadays we basically just get a digital wax up in our inbox or these days I actually do this part myself with the three shape laboratory software. And then we basically just print out that diagnostic wax up model in our uh, 3D printer, our desktop 3D printer and we create a putty matrix. And so then prior to actually preparing the teeth we'll actually do a bisacryl transfer right over the untreated teeth and 
now we can take our photographs again. We can show our patient. We can actually confirm that what we designed on the computer is actually something that's going to be aesthetically pleasing and more importantly, functional in the patient. So it's very easy to create something on a computer screen. You don't necessarily know how it's going to work live uh, until you do this. And so this is a really important part of the process for me to actually confirm that I have the right design before we sit down to prep these eight teeth and do something that is not reversible for the patient. And by the way, before we take that mock-up off, I take half of it off and this is the final 50-50 shot. On the day that we prepare the teeth, we use that mock-up matrix again after we've prepped the teeth to create the provisionals. And um, it never ceases to amaze me that we take these provisionals out, they haven't been trimmed yet. And when you compare the contours of what we just created from that, that mock-up um, putty matrix, it's essentially exactly the same as what the, the designer designed on the computer screen. So something on the computer screen is now something that we're holding in our hand. And that it really speaks to the predictability of these, of these workflows and these processes is that we can design on the screen and we can create that. And once you start to feel comfortable with that, we can feel more confident to present treatment to the patient because we know we can, we can produce it and deliver it. These were the restorations for this case prior to delivery. And what you see on the left is the trio scan of our actual um, provisionals in the patient that were approved. And we checked occlusion a week later and we create that scan. And now the laboratory just has to copy that. When we, when we delivered these restorations, this is uh, just the restorations tried in with water. Um, they're not bonded in yet. And the only area we needed to adjust was actually the contact point between the central incisors slightly. Needless to say, we moved on to bonding these restorations and um, the tissue a week later is starting to heal and the patient is feeling happy. We bring the patients back to do a post-op check and we check the occlusion. Um, we take our post-operative photos and more importantly, we take the final trio scan and this becomes our post-op scan. Um, this is a really important part of the process because if we don't record this final result, what do we do in a year or two? And she comes back and she says, hey, my bite has changed or this tooth is sticking out. You, you need to have this data to go back to run your trios patient monitoring again so that you have data, you're armed with it, you're armed with this data and you can utilize, you never know how you're gonna utilize this data in the future. And so, what we see time and time again is that when we look at the wax up phase to the provisional to the final, it's essentially all the same shapes uh, and contours that we design on the computer screen. And this is the prosthetic process map. If you see where we have the trio scans, you know, we take them at very specific uh, milestones. Um, and we call this process, I call this process prosthetic timelining. And you know, I have this timeline of scans that I want to get. I want my preoperative. I want uh, a scan of my mock-up. I want two scans of the provisional. I want the, the, the immediately following treatment on the day of preparation. And a week later, after we do a trial and refinement, I want another scan. And then I want a scan of the final. Here's another one that we can add. If we have a layered case and we want to actually evaluate if the laboratory changed any of the contours significantly from the pre-op, before we put this case in the patient's mouth, when we get it back from the laboratory, you can actually just put the restorations on the printed model and you can scan that with your trios and that becomes another prosthetic timeline. And we can actually compare the finished lab work on the printed model compared to the provisionals, compared to the wax ups. And we can really see you know, how well the laboratory did and so this is what we started to do at some of our final restorations and is that we just add this one more scan uh, and it becomes part of the lab uh, part of the timeline and when we do this we're very careful to be sure that we had good alignment uh, and with this particular case when we looked at this so these are the actual crowns on the left on the printed model compared with the approved provisionals that we wanted them to copy. And you can see here, when you see the blue and white speckling, it means that both of those data sets are essentially very similar. So we know the laboratory did 
a very good job in recreating the contours of our provisionals with the layered restorations that they sent back to us. When we look at it from the front, we do see that the layered ceramic is slightly longer on that upper right lateral than the patient provisional. And that doesn't mean that I'm going to go grinding it in the lab, but I just know, you know where my adjustments may be on the day of bonding. And that gives me a lot more security when um, I'm getting ready to try in a big case. I kind of already know how it's going to go before it goes. And that's the beauty of using TRIO's patient monitoring and all of these restorative workflows. We also have a way to really use TRIO's patient monitoring as a kind of a digital reduction coping that we've all had from our laboratories. And if you get a veneer back, uh, like in this case I did, and I didn't reduce enough of the incisal facial third that I was supposed to, um, we have a, a prep scan, right? We can actually get that scan and use that um, as a comparative scan to the veneers on the on the model. And now on, on the day that I need to go and reduce this little area for this veneer to sit without bringing the patient back and re-prepping re and whatnot, I know how much to take away from where. And this leads me to this concept that we that um, I coined restorative forensics. And this is, you know, how do you manage complications in your office where uh, you start off with the best of intentions um, and you have a complication? And it's happened to me as well. Um, you know, even with all this technology, things can sometimes uh, go awry. Uh, and it did for this patient, actually, who um, was getting a full upper reconstruction. She had uh, two sets of provisionals. The first set of the provisionals were perfect. She was very happy with them. It, it was just like on my patient, Kathy. Uh, it followed uh, the digital wax up. She was really happy. She broke those within a couple of days for whatever reason. And so I said, don't worry, you know, I'll send out and I'll have a milled set made. And what I didn't realize was that when I sent out to that laboratory, the designer actually changed the design. They didn't just copy my wax up. They took it upon themselves to actually change it. And so when I put this, this bridge in, which is what you're seeing on the left side of the screen, she came back a couple of days later and she says, my bite is completely wrong. And this is a full arch now. And she said, my bite is wrong. I can't find my bite. Uh, and if we didn't have this kind of data, how do we manage this? You take the football burr out, right? And we, we start to grind away and hopefully the patient's going to tell us when it's okay. But now we've lost all control. And that's a rabbit hole that um, you don't really want to be going down. If you've been down that road, you know, that's not a comfortable place to be. But, you know, having all this data and using the patient monitoring, you know, we just took a scan of the new provisionals that she didn't like and we compared it to the set of provisionals that she did like because we have timeline scans of all these things. And what we found out is when she says that my bite is wrong, she was absolutely right. We had opened the bite with the new uh, temps that the lab had changed it. Her bite was open by about 0.76 millimeters in the posterior. She was open in the anterior. Uh, and when she said that uh, everything felt too big, she was completely right there. Look at how much I had this over contoured, about a millimeter in this area. I didn't do a very good job with this. But the fact is I was able to identify it very quickly. And basically by making some notes on a little napkin, actually, I was actually able to, to equilibrate this patient's bite with how much I needed to take away. And within 10 minutes, she said that everything feels good now. And then to be sure that it's not just in her head. We took another scan and we compared it again and we basically got it back to where it was with the first set of provisionals. And so this is really how we use these patient engagement apps for so much more than really just even engaging the patient. We use it as a restorative tool all the time and it makes these more complex cases less complex. And that leads to us feeling more empowered to be able to treat the whole patient and maybe treat cases that we wouldn't have treated in the past. And that's really what I found is in my personal experience, because it really has to do with the confidence that we get of data alignment. Now, for the last part of the presentation, I'm going to actually show you 
you know, how this data is aligned. And, you know, that's done in the laboratory software. That's not in the TRIO software. It's not in dental desktop. It's in Three Shape Dental System. Three Shape Dental System is the laboratory CAD software used in dental laboratories. And I'm going to show you that now because, um, you know, that's really the key to being able to connect all these dots and, and, and really be comfortable in, in using these records to uh, deliver complex care. And so there's a, um, a component within the Three Shape Dental System software called the RealView Engine. And it's kind of like the analog to smile design in the laboratory software. And you saw it a little bit in Kathy's case. But basically, it all has to do with data alignment. If you can take very good portrait photographs, like in this case, I took a trio scan of myself. And basically now that 3D trio scan is being aligned to the two-dimensional photograph. And this is kind of a virtual Facebook. This is, this is what the laboratory is doing with our smile design to actually get to the next step where we're actually creating the smile. And you, you can see here is that we've aligned my trio scan to my face with no less than 10 points of alignment, both anterior and posterior. And we can really trust that this alignment is um, reproducible and um, that it is reliable. But we can also do something else these days is that we can actually use facial scanning. And so there's an app called Bellis 3D that's available uh, through the app store. Um, it's an, it's an Apple only, and it needs to be done on an iPhone 10 or better that any iPhone that has a face ID camera. Uh, and so basically we can take a scan with an iPhone or um, an iPad, and we can actually use that and, and align that as well. There's actually a dental pro app that you can purchase from Bellis 3D. This is right out of the app store. And you can actually take your trio scan and you bring it into this Bellis Dental Pro app and you can do the same kind of alignment to the 3D facial scan. Uh, you can actually also export out uh, prosthodontic landmarks like the interpupillary line, the, the campers plane, the occlusal plane. Um, because one of the first things that happens in laboratory software is setting the occlusal plane. And when you don't have actual reference points, it's done somewhat arbitrarily. But using the Bellis 3D Dental Pro app, we I, I actually exported the uh, my midline and my campers plane and my occlusal plane, and now I can actually orient my trio scan to the actual occlusal plane um, of me. And so what you're looking at here is we're going to layer some more data on top of one another. So now you're looking at that that photo that I showed you before with my trio scan layered on top of that with the Bellis 3D scan layered on top of that. And you can see that everything still aligns really, really well, even when you zoom in really, really close here. And so let's take it one step further. How about you have all of that and then we apply patient specific motion. And so now we've actually moved the, um, the hinge elements of this SAM2 articulator to uh, where my condyles actually are. So you, you can actually palpate where uh, the hinge axis is on the mandible. And now we can situate the, the virtual articulator you know, based on the facial scan you know, to there. And now it's actually running the actual mandibular movements of me that I recorded with the trio scan. Let's take it one step further than that. In that we can, if we have a CBCT, we can actually convert that DICOM CBCT to an STL and bring it in as an additional scan. And now we can actually look at the bone information as well. And, and so this really shows you, you know, how far a lot of this technology has come. It really shows you, you know, how much more it is than just taking an intraoral scan, sending it to your laboratory and making a crown. It, it becomes a, like a whole other way to communicate and to think about dentistry when you're leveraging and using all of these um, patient engagement apps and all these software applications um, that ultimately provide data alignment. And we're using the data alignment for case presentation, transparency, and trust. And then uh, on, 
on the um, on the dentistry side, we're using the data alignment to actually produce the dentistry. So the beauty of all of this is that we all have much more choice than we ever had before. The beauty of all of this is that we are able to, um, it becomes a reflection of what you want it to become. The beauty is we find new ways to, to do things that we have never done before. And really the beauty is that we get to have more fun. And so with that, I thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Rajan, for the great presentation. And of course, thank you to 3Shape for sponsoring tonight's webinar. As a thank you for attending, everyone will receive the recording via email sometime in the next week. Thank you all for joining us. Have a great night.